It was September 4, 1955, and the Kadena Air Base in Okinawa Prefecture, Japan, buzzes with the vibrant energy of military drill sessions in full swing. Looking from above, the runway stretches out, flanked by aircraft hangars and strategically positioned facilities. Against this backdrop, the air is filled with the distinctive sounds of aircraft engines, the cadence of footsteps on the tarmac, and the commands of military personnel engaged in drills. But the commands were not in Japanese. They were in English. That's because Kadena was a United States air base, manned by American soldiers. Situated along the western coastline of Okinawa, the airbase found itself in close proximity to a beach quarry garbage dump, mere steps away from the vast expanse of the China Sea. Referred to by the locals using various names such as landfills or dump sites, this area was the main solution for waste management in the airbase. It was the go-to place for the military to dump their trash, packaging waste, discarded food, abandoned equipment, and even construction debris. The landfill quickly became an amalgamation of the various byproducts generated within the airbase's operational sphere. And the cumulative impact of that within this location undoubtedly contributed to an awful stench. However, on this specific day, the smell of the landfill may have taken on a more macabre note, as it carried an unmistakable undertone of decomposing human flesh. The 4th of September was a Sunday, typically a day of rest and family gatherings. But at the landfill near the Kadena Air Base, a body was found. Upon a closer inspection, it was the lifeless form of a young girl, bearing the unmistakable marks of mutilation. Immediately, Japanese law enforcement began a thorough investigation to ascertain the identity of the young girl. She was later identified as Yumiko Nagayama, also reported as Yumiko Arakaki, a five-year-old attending kindergarten in Ishikawa, now the city of Yuruma. At 8 p.m. the day before, Yumiko's parents became aware that she hadn't returned home after playing outside, prompting them to file an urgent police report. However, they now faced the devastating news that their daughter's lifeless body had been discovered. What exactly had happened, and more importantly, how did an innocent five-year-old girl meet her tragic end in a remote landfill, miles away from her home? Upon closer examination, investigators were shocked to discover that Yumiko's body bore the horrifying marks of an unspeakable act. The child's body had been mutilated, possibly with a sharp knife, cutting from the abdominal region and extending down to the bowel. Evidence found on her genital region also suggests that she had endured a severe and brutal sexual assault. At a time where forensic analysis was still in its early days, the process of identifying the culprit responsible for such a heinous act would have been a protracted affair, spanning days or even weeks. Despite these challenges, investigators stumbled upon a crucial breakthrough during their examination of Yumiko's body strands of hair. Putting it against the light, it was revealed that these strands of hair were light brown, in stark contrast to the majority of Japanese who typically have black hair. For the Japanese investigators, this deviation in hair color became a compelling clue, suggesting the involvement of a foreigner. Then the natural question arose, who were the closest foreigners situated at the crime scene? the American soldiers stationed at Kadena Air Base. You're listening to Heinous, an Asian true crime podcast produced by 1UP Media. This episode may contain sensitive details and graphic imagery. Listener discretion is advised. One of the most iconic photographs taken of American war history was captured in February 1945 during the Battle on Iwo Jima. 
a small volcanic island situated a thousand miles east of Okinawa. In stark black and white, the photograph immortalizes six U.S. soldiers raising the American flag atop Mount Suribachi, a victorious celebration after an intense struggle for dominance by the U.S. forces. Two months after this photograph was taken, on April 1st, 1945, over 60,000 U.S. soldiers stormed the beaches of Okinawa, marking the final island battle before the full-scale invasion of mainland Japan. Fierce fighting ensued in the island's southern region amid challenging conditions, including heavy rains and rugged terrain. The intense land, sea and air battle persisted for nearly three months before finally concluding in June 1945. However, the cost was high, with 12,000 US soldiers, 90,000 Japanese combatants, and more than 150,000 Okinawan civilians losing their lives. But before the Okinawa invasion in 1945, American troops discovered an abandoned and severely damaged 1,500-meter coral-surfaced runway close to the Ryokuen village of Kadena. Seizing the opportunity, U.S. Army engineers immediately began efforts to fill craters and undertake necessary repairs. By nightfall, the airfield was deemed suitable for emergency landings only. But just eight days later, the airfield achieved full operational status. In 1955, following the end of World War II, Japan emerged as a crucial ally in the Asia-Pacific region, and the U.S sought to establish a robust military presence to maintain stability and to counter any potential threats. Recognizing its critical importance, the United States established a permanent U.S. airbase at Kadena, solidifying its commitment to the region's security and fostering a lasting military alliance with Japan. However, in Okinawan history, 1955 remained significant, not because of the birth of a new alliance, but because it marked the infamous Yumiko-chan incident. The central figure in this tragic episode was Yumiko Nagoyama, a five-year-old girl whose mutilated body was found in a landfill that belonged to Kadena Air Base. At the time, a pervasive belief gripped the community, and everyone was pointing accusing fingers at one of the soldiers stationed in Kadena Air Base as the likely suspect in this heart-wrenching incident. And it's not hard to understand why. Initially, when Yumiko's body underwent examination, strands of brown hair were discovered. Since the locals predominantly had black hair, the presence of brown strands indicated a deviation, reinforcing the belief that the perpetrator was likely a foreigner, such as the soldiers stationed at the airbase. Furthermore, during the 1950s, the frequency of rapes and sexual assaults had escalated to such an alarming extent that the commander of Kadena Air Base, Major General William J. Wallace, found it necessary to issue a stern warning to his men. In an attempt to curb any further distressing incidents, General Wallace threatened the use of the death penalty for rape but unfortunately, these stringent measures never worked. In the aftermath of the brutal crime's disclosure, a collaborative investigation conducted by both the U.S. military and the Ryukyu police, the civilian police agency in Okinawa during that period, yielded a significant breakthrough. On the day of the crime, eyewitnesses claimed to have encountered five-year-old Yumiko at an ISA performance a traditional folk dance deeply rooted in the Okinawa Island's cultural fabric. Aisha, a dance performed by the youth of each community during the Bon Festival, serves as a reverent tribute to the spirits of ancestors. Eyewitnesses present at the performance reported seeing young Yumiko departing the venue in the company of a white man, strongly suggesting that the likely perpetrator was a U.S. serviceman. Upon raising this matter with the commander of Kadena Air Base, an internal inquiry was promptly initiated, leading to the submission of charges against 31-year-old 
Sergeant Isaac J. Hurd of B Battalion, 32nd Artillery Division. The indictment encompassed several severe allegations, including murder, rape, and kidnapping. When news of the suspect became public, protesters flooded the city streets, their voices echoing with fervent demands for justice. During the period of the Yumiko-chan protests, another child became a target of violence after Yumiko's death, deepening the community's anguish. In bold headlines, the Okinawa Shimbun newspaper declared, Every Okinawan is burning with indignation. Prior to this outrage, Okinawans were instructed by the government to refrain from resisting their occupiers. They were cautioned against adopting an anti-American stance, being angry or critical, engaging in excessive conversation, lying or disruptive behavior. The instructions were often quite explicit, emphasizing specific actions such as refraining from raising their hands above their ears, avoiding shouting, and maintaining a composed speaking demeanor. However, the tragedy of Yumiko's rape and murder marked a turning point, prompting the majority of Okinawans to defy the orders and voice out their collective anger. While it's understandable that the people of Okinawa were furious, it's crucial to recognize that specific actions were taken in support of the U.S. soldiers before this entire tragedy unfolded. You see, the Okinawa Islands we know today are surrounded by beautiful reefs, inviting waters, lush forests, and plenty of sunshine. But back in the 1950s, the perception of Okinawa as an island paradise was starkly different, characterized by a harsher and less idyllic reality. The island, once considered a hot and desolate landscape, was far from an appealing deployment destination. Okinawa, during a certain period, transformed into a dumping ground for army misfits, leaving U.S. soldiers grappling with boredom and misery. In an effort to boost morale and ostensibly protect the virtue of mainland Japanese children and women, both Japan and the U.S. established a system of institutionalized prostitution, marked by the establishment of bars and brothels. In the small village of Hanoko, Okinawa, over a hundred GI bars emerged. These establishments not only provided entertainment for the soldiers, but also functioned as second-floor brothels. To the local Okinawan people, practices such as prostitution were not only frowned upon, but were considered substantial taboos. Furthermore, the existence of GI bars specifically catering to U.S. soldiers was already regarded as a noteworthy compromise, given that these establishments often conflicted with the traditional values upheld by the Japanese people. Therefore, the big question from the public was why would soldiers from this community, who already enjoyed such liberties, continue to harm one of their own? Even more distressing was the question of why someone would target an innocent and defenseless five-year-old child. The revelation of Yumiko's brutal rape and murder at the hands of a U.S. serviceman sparked intense outrage among the Okinawan community. But the situation was about to take a much dire turn. Not only did the suspect deny all allegations of it, but due to extraterritoriality laws, the alleged perpetrator would not face an Okinawan trial. Instead, the case would be subject to a U.S. military court martial. The Okinawan people were furious about this arrangement because it meant that justice would be determined within the U.S. military jurisdiction raising concerns about transparency, accountability, and the ability to ensure a fair trial. The people trusted their own local justice system, as its cultural understanding and connection to the incident would be better suited to deliver justice for Yumiko. Hence, they marched the streets once again in protest, demanding for Sergeant Isaac J. Hurt to be handed over to face Okinawan justice. Mitsuko Takeno, the then president of the Okinawa Women's Association said, If this act was committed by an Okinawan, the people would probably surround his house and stone it, and indignation will reach its peak 
and they will probably lynch this person. But because of the fact that it was committed by an American, nothing has taken place so far. Two weeks after the girl's discovery, Major General James E. Moore addressed a crowded community town hall, expressing his deeper sympathy to a community relations advisory council. During his speech, he pledged changes, proposing potential restrictions or even the cessation of his soldiers' leave time. This would have left everyone slightly appeased with the situation, but Okinawans immediately recognized that putting these rules into action would severely harm the local economy. The Okinawan economy depended heavily on American troops who were patrons of local businesses, and any restrictions would result in significant adverse effects. General Moore also warned the people against implying that Americans support violence. He considered it an insult to the American people. And on the topic of why Sergeant Hurd would be tried in a US court rather than a Japanese one, he vigorously defended the Army's judicial system, asserting that there has never been an attempt at whitewashing or covering up any case. As the Yumiko-chan incident continues to develop, the greatest fears of the Okinawan people are on the verge of realization. Investigations revealed that prior to his arrest, Sergeant Hurt had indulged in excessive drinking and revelry with prostitutes. When he was apprehended by army police, he even requested a cigarette and taunted the investigators with chilling remarks about the girl's killing, insinuating a disturbing connection. But that's not all, because in the years that follow, Sergeant Isaac Hurd, the man behind the heinous rape and murder of five-year-old Yumiko, will see his sentence commuted by one US president before being set free by another. In September of 1955, the mutilated body of a five-year-old girl was found in a landfill that belonged to the Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. When investigators found strands of brown hair on Yumiko's body, they speculated that the perpetrator must have been a foreigner. This suspicion led to a collaborative investigation involving both the US military and the Ryukyu police, which culminated in the arrest of 31-year-old Sergeant Isaac J. Hurt. Facing grave charges including rape, murder, and kidnapping, Sergeant Hurd was swiftly taken into custody to address the public outrage. The news triggered widespread outrage among Okinawans, and their anger had only intensified due to the extraterritoriality laws, which meant that Yumiko's alleged rapist and murderer would not be subject to an Okinawan trial, but rather a US military court martial. In response to this incident, a rally for the protection of children was organized in Okinawa, leading to the formation of the APC, the Association for the Protection of Children. Many Okinawans rallied in the streets in support of this cause, demanding justice. This was just days after the discovery of Yumiko's body, and to make matters worse, weeks after another US serviceman named Raymond Parker was sentenced to life in prison for the rape of a nine-year-old Okinawan girl. It's not hard to see why the locals were deeply frustrated. They had generously allowed US soldiers to access their land and utilize their resources for the war effort. However, instead of gratitude, the soldiers entered Okinawa and inflicted pain and suffering on the local population. At the time, the majority of rape or sexual assault cases were committed by foreigners, particularly US servicemen. When it was announced that Sergeant Isaac J. Hurd would be trialed in a US military court martial, Okinawans vehemently insisted that the US military should, quote, punish offenders of this kind of case with the death penalty without leniency, regardless of nationality or ethnicity. They further demanded that Hurd be tried in a civilian court and that the proceedings be publicly broadcasted. However, these demands were denied. The Okinawan people feared that a trial in a US military court might result in a more lenient sentence for Hurt. However, their concerns were somewhat appeased when the trial concluded. 
The court martial lasted for 13 days and was packed full of twists and turns. During the trial, the prosecution's key witness was a nine-year-old boy who testified that he had seen an American GI resembling Hurt on the day of the incident. However, this young boy could not positively identify Hurt in a lineup of suspects. Another witness was Yoshiko Kamimura, a waitress that testified about seeing bloodstains on Hurt's pants. The records, however, do not specify whether this testimony was validated or considered during sentencing. Hair samples had also been collected from the door handle and seat cover in the sergeant's vehicle, but none of it seemed to match the victim or directly implicate Isaac Hurd in the murder. In December of 1955, despite Hurd insisting that he was innocent and all the circumstantial evidence surrounding the case, he was ultimately sentenced to death for the rape and murder of five-year-old Yumiko. While the Okinawan community found some solace in the verdict, no one at the time could fathom that this sentence was only temporary. Following his sentencing, Isaac Hurd returned to the US and several politicians swiftly came to his defense. Carl D. Perkins, a Democrat from the state of Kentucky, was particularly concerned over the case. Perkins wrote a formal letter to the White House suggesting that something could be done about the death sentence. Another senator from Kentucky pushed for the sentence to be commuted, stating, The conviction rests upon circumstantial evidence, and there exists some doubt concerning the guilt or innocence of the accused. Another three more senators across different states would go on to plead for the case to be reviewed again, this time more thoroughly. One among them was the future president of the United States, Lyndon B. Johnson, who had personally requested a law firm to help with Isaac Hurd's appeals. Upon the verdict of a death sentence, Isaac Hurd's attorney promptly appealed to the panel, seeking clemency and a reassessment of the case. He submitted letters and petitions from Hurd's hometown in southeast Kentucky, portraying him as honest and law-abiding. However, the prosecution counted by presenting an affidavit revealing that Hurd had previously served 11 months in prison for assault and attempted rape in the United States. It seems that all hope was lost for the sergeant, and he was destined to meet the gallows. Records state that Isaac Hurd remained reticent during his time on death row. He once believed that the floods in Kentucky at the time had washed away the entire state, which was the reason why he never received any letters from his people. To the politicians that were advocating for Isaac's release, they had to defend him as he was a local Kentucky boy, one of their own. Recognizing that Isaac faced slim chances of being released amidst the intense pressure from the Okinawan people, they strategically waited for the anger to subside and for attention to shift toward anti-American protests instead. It was precisely during this period that these politicians swiftly intervened and fiercely defended the sergeant. Kentucky Republican Eugene Seiler began by writing a letter to then US President Dwight Eisenhower, stating, The father of this serviceman is 88 years of age, and his mother is 77. They have not seen their son for more than six years. Other Hurt supporters also began to rally, and the White House, under President Eisenhower's leadership, began to succumb to the mounting pressure. On one hand, Isaac Hurt had never personally confessed to the crime, and forensic evidence from the hair samples did not directly tie him to the incident. Furthermore, no eyewitnesses could directly connect him to Yumiko on the night of the incident, and even the heavily intoxicated sergeant himself couldn't remember what happened. Conversely, commuting his sentence might be perceived as a partial and unfair move to the Okinawan people. President Eisenhower spent weeks grappling with this dilemma. Was the death penalty an appropriate sentence for someone convicted on circumstantial evidence? Or was Sergeant Isaac Hurd merely being used as a scapegoat to pacify the Okinawan people? In June of 1960, five years after the crime, 
President Eisenhower responded to increasing public pressure and decided to commute Isaac Hurd's sentence to 45 years without the possibility of parole. Hurd later served as an administrative trustee at the Fort Leavenworth Prison in Kansas, but suffered a stroke in 1969 while playing sports. As time passed, Hurd experienced the loss of function in his right arm and leg, navigating the prison yard with the support of a cane. Nevertheless, he persisted in challenging his 45-year sentence. In a letter addressed to his pardon attorney, the Senate and President Gerald Ford's Attorney General, he wrote, The way things are here, there is nothing to hope for me. I can only believe that I was sacrificed to appease the dissident political elements who were demanding an end to the American military occupation. In January 1977, President Ford approved Isaac Hurd's eligibility for parole and by November of the same year, he was seen leaving the prison but walking with a limp. In 1981, he married a woman named Laura who worked as a kitchen helper. A year later, Laura began the process of submitting documents to the White House in Washington, aiming to secure a complete presidential pardon for him. Reports indicate that during his time on death row, Sergeant Isaac Hurd was perceived as distant and unemotional. Descriptions painted him as tall, skinny, and someone who preferred to keep to himself. Following his release from prison, his wife Laura portrayed him in a different light, characterizing him as a law-abiding, good and moral citizen. Contrary to the expectation of meeting his end at the end of a noose in prison, Sergeant Hurd passed away in August 1984 within the comfort of a hospital in Ohio. He died while still waiting for a response from the White House. Currently, Isaac is buried beneath an official grave marker supplied by the Department of Veteran Affairs. In a cemetery in Ohio State, the marker commemorates his World War II service in the U.S. Navy before his subsequent enlistment with the Army on Okinawa. Though it makes no reference to the latter period of his life. According to the guidelines established by the VA, grave markers should not be supplied to service members who have been discharged from the military under any dishonorable circumstances. Additionally, veterans or servicemen who have committed a capital crime or specific sex offences may also be ineligible for receiving burial and memorial benefits. The Chief of Public Affairs and Outreach at the VA's National Cemetery Administration has stated that Isaac's case is currently undergoing a thorough review and corrective actions will be taken if it is determined that the marker was issued in error. Heinous, an Asian true crime podcast, is brought to you by One Up Media. This episode was produced and written by Guang Jin, edited by Alex, narrated by Jason, audio experience by Ethan Sam, additional engineering by Ashley from One Up Media. Thank you for listening. We'll see you in the next one.